ask me for this video a lot. At least once a week, somebody asked me, how do you study history? How do you write your video essays? So I decided I'm finally gonna tell you guys. I got my degree in history from The Ohio State University, but I've always loved history since I was a jit. So I'm gonna give you guys my six steps to writing video essays, and hopefully this helps you study history in general. This is a crash course in working with historical sources, writing persuasively, thinking critically, and organizing ideas. Before we get to my six steps, let me tell you about an app that's taken over my life lately, Babbel. It's obvious that my favorite topic in school was history, but I was never any good at learning new languages. If I would have had the Babbel app, maybe I'd be fluent in Spanish by now. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world because it's a practical and fun way to learn new languages with an emphasis on prepping for real world conversations. According to a scientific study by Yale University, 75% of Babbel users accomplish their language goals thanks to the app. I've got an upcoming trip to Colombia and it'll be my first time in South America. Yes, I'm super excited, but I really want to be able to have basic conversations while I'm there. And with Babbel, I feel prepared. There's even travel specific lessons that come in bite-sized lessons as short as five minutes. Donde esta la baño? Mi trae la cuenta? And most importantly, donde esta la playa? I'll be eating a lot of good food, so it'll be important to know what to say. In Mexico, you can find... Fresh. Quiero tomar un jugo. Quiero tomar un jugo. In the mood for a sweet drink. Voy a pedir una chela. Voy a pedir una chela. La cuenta, por favor. La cuenta, por favor. I love this app. If there's someone on your holiday wish list who wants to learn a new language or is going to a foreign country, this is the perfect gift. Or spoil yourself. When you click the link in my description box, you get 60% off your subscription. And there are monthly and lifetime options. What language do you want to learn? French? German? Indonesian? Italian? Let me know in the comments. Ahora, hablamos de historia. My history styles are big picture, social, and cultural. I'm more interested in the who and why and the patterns rather than military history or the actions of a single person. Here is the very first outline I made for Lectual Does the 80s. It's not even two pages is long, but by the time I finish with the series, the entire text for the series is approximately 110,000 words. How did I organize everything thematically and chronologically? Let's begin. Ask myself questions. This stage of the essay writing process is very organic and often spontaneous. Let's say I've stumbled across a stupid tweet or a puzzling statistic. My mind begins turning over the possibilities. Before I know it, I've asked myself a bunch of questions. And these often get written down, though whether or something will come from them is another story altogether. Together. While writing these questions, I'm also writing what I already know, plus sketching out rough ideas or hypotheses about what I'm going to write about. I plug my list into search engines, culling more research questions and potential areas of interest. While I consider popular thought leaders in these topics, I also seek out not so popular opinions so I can be prepared to measure their worth against my own ideas. For Lectual Does the 80s, my main questions were, what are the biggest misconceptions about the 1980s? What 1980s events had direct bearings on 2021 America, what was the role of globalization? And what would life had been like for me, a poor black woman from North Carolina? stage, I toss my questions into a few categories, each with a few core ideas that I want to prove or disprove. I nail down the time periods I'm addressing, which is the scope of the issues, and who I'll be talking about, usually black people and or black women. I'm essentially organizing events and theories into themes for my audience while also keeping track of them chronologically. For example, with Lectual Does the 80s, I knew I wanted six episodes. While constantly thinking about those four questions I asked in the first step, I organized events in to themes that would be easy for my audience to keep track of. Wealth inequality, growing up in the 80s, being a woman in the 80s, etc. By the way, listening to music or watching relevant archival footage is a good idea during this part of the process. I also found it helpful to print out timelines of each year for the 1980s just so I could keep track of things chronologically, though I can't stress enough that this is simply a jumping off point for research and that fact checking everything from web sources like these is key. They do not include everything and may misrepresent represent certain events. 
during this stage, I'm pulling sources that I will read before writing and drawing my final conclusions. I prefer physical copies of things, so I usually print articles and PDFs that aren't too long and order physical copies of books. The entire time I'm doing this, I'm vetting the sources to make sure they're legitimate by considering who wrote it, why, when, where, and how much of the source material is cited. I consider whether or not the information in the source is in other sources, considering why or why not. For instance, it was common for black newspapers and publications in the mid 20th century to feature stories that mainstream media did not. It's also important to consider what common or not so common knowledge each source is omitting and why. Lastly, I compile all of the interviews, articles, recordings, essays, speeches, surveys, etc. into folders, both physical and digital, and create a schedule to study them. I also have a selection of online databases bookmarked to my Google Chrome. Oh, and there's also two file cabinets full of past readings from the past six, seven years organized alphabetically that I can always comb through for additional perspective. For Lectual Does the 80s, I have seven folders with relevant readings in them. And when I was working on episode one, if I found a source for a future episode, I'd print it and put it in the folder or keep the link in an iMac note for later. So this part is all about synthesizing, baby. While taking notes on the curated sources, I am frequently tweaking the outline and treating it like a living, breathing thing. I move things around, delete things, and add things. For instance, during my second outline revision for Lectual Does the 80s, I realized that I wanted to add an episode that would expand on media, mental health, and physical wellness. During this note-taking stage, I consider how each source confirms or challenges the assumptions that I've written down, what I started with. Like during episode three, when I addressed the war on drugs and heightened policing in the black community, I couldn't leave out the ways in which black Americans themselves contributed to harsher policing and drug sentencing. By reading primary sources from that time and secondary sources like James Foreman Jr.'s locking up their own, I was able to lessen my own bias and present the facts more clearly. It's important when dealing with primary documents to keep in mind the social standards, assumptions, and realities of the period I'm observing. When a primary source author from Washington, D.C. calls for more policing, for example, why not dig into murder rates, robbery rates, etc.? Why not consider the ways in which the media in DC was reporting on these crimes? And as my notes become more complete and I finish reading my sources, though inevitably I always add more, the strings of ideas in the outline become sentences and sentences become paragraphs. I think about if the topic at hand has been a recurring theme or trend in world history, and if so, research how past humans responded or acted and why. This is key to my style of history considering patterns rather than assuming anything is new. As I write, I consider my audience in a number of ways. One, what are my viewers expecting and what aren't they? Two, how might someone whose opinions on the topic I disagree with respond to my words? How can I disarm their argument before they even attempt to leave a comment? Three, when it comes to conspiracy theorists, I think about how I can strip their thinking down to the historical event or misunderstanding that birthed it and respond to it in an honest way. Basically, it's important to me to disarm arm opinions I don't agree with by reporting them objectively while providing another perspective backed by facts and my own research. Now I can't persuade everybody to agree with my findings that way, but at least one or two people get flipped and I usually call that pancake flipping. They'll be in the comments and they'll be like, oh my God, I never thought of it that way. Or oh my God, you made me think about something differently and that's always the goal. But also it's during this stage that I get comfortable with the idea that the theories or answers I was leaning towards may not be credible. This calls for checking my own bias, which leads me to step number five. Re, re, re. I just had to say it. This stage is all about rereading familiar sources, revising what I've already written, and re-researching from a new, more informed perspective. Is there another big idea question that I need to seek to answer? Is there an additional interview from a black burlesque dancer I can dig up? Is there another menu from a 20th century black owned restaurant? Is there another 1920s article about Halloween that confirms or challenges what I've written? And when it comes to the 80s, I constantly kept those big four questions from the original outline in mind. This keeps me 
focus. This keeps the essays in line. And often, the ever-present possibility of more obscure stories and details out there somewhere slows down my process because I'm trying to offensively strike down all the commenters who say things like, I can't believe you didn't comment on XYZ Lectual. So I'll go and try to make sure that I've covered everything from every angle, and this usually takes forever. I print each draft, read through it carefully while rearranging paragraphs, deleting things that aren't relevant or interesting enough, and fixing mistakes until I feel like it's as close to excellent as it can be. And most importantly, as close to being evergreen as possible. Will people be able to watch this content in five, 10, 20 years, and will it still make sense? That is always the goal. And again, this takes forever, but eventually I tear myself away and say enough is enough. That is, until I'm hunting for B-roll. So the script is on its third or fourth draft by now, and I'm already on step one through four for another video essay at this point. But now is the best part for me in the whole process. I read the script again for the umpteenth time. By this time, I've lost count of how many times I've read this script, and I read it again while writing a very thorough list of all the B-roll I wanna use. Depending on how long the script is, it's approximately 100 to 500 things that I look for to make the video as entertaining and visually appealing as possible. And for this reason, I'm sure my video editor hates me. I'm looking for additional news clippings and magazine scans, archival footage, art, subject photos, charts, and more. Sometimes I make my own graphics, but this process is super fun because I watch a lot of archival footage, TV shows, music videos, etc., which adds another layer of complexity to my final piece of writing. And it's not uncommon for me to slide in additional facts during this stage. So then the script is done and I get all gussied up, film it and send it off to my video editor to be prepared for YouTube. This year alone, I've created 11 such long format videos for you guys using this method. And shout out to all of my Patreon subscribers for making this possible. I really hope you picked up a new tip for studying history, or at the very least, a newer appreciation of what I do. The series finale of Lectual Does the 80s premieres this January, 2023, and the book version of the series, along with Lectual Does the 90s, Yes, It's Happening, will premiere in 2023 as well. Thanks so much for watching this and I hope you guys like and subscribe.